So today, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Pastor Kurt. I'm the adults pastor here at Grace Point. We want to welcome you all to worship today. You guys made it post-Christmas. Congratulations. Nice job. Uh, we also want to welcome everybody watching online this morning as well. Uh, we appreciate you tuning in. We're so grateful to be able to worship with you today, to be the body, the family, right? You know, we celebrated with our families Christmas, and now we get to celebrate with our extended family here today. So we're excited to do that with you. Over the next two weeks, we're going to be looking at uh, this idea, this prayer of the early church. And it says uh, Maranatha. And the early church used to end their prayers with, with this phrase of Maranatha. And what does that mean, Maranatha? And as we kind of piggyback a little bit on the last two weeks of suddenly, right? So we looked at the idea that Jesus has come and is going to come again in a very sudden moment. That he came suddenly as this little baby. And he's going to come again as a returning king. Amen. Suddenly. And so this idea of Maranatha in, in the season of an Advent is the season of anticipation of the return of Jesus, this idea of Maranatha. And what it means is simply this. It's an Aramaic word, and it means, come, Lord. Oh, come, Lord. And so the early church, this was their hope. This was their joy to know that the circumstances of this life is not where it ends. That Maranatha, come Lord, that we have joy, we have hope, we have peace because Jesus has come and indeed he is returning Amen. to rescue us. In this idea of, of come, Lord. And we see what this does for the Christian, the believer, the follower of Jesus is this. It produces a response within us. And as I look at the two different seasons of Advent, right? So we have the first one where Jesus is the little baby. We just celebrated that yesterday. The birth of Christ, the sudden moment, and what it meant for Christ to come. And we look at that and, and we, we have great joy. We have great joy that God has come in the flesh, that Emmanuel, God with us, is here. And that produces joy within our hearts that we just sing joy to the world. The Lord has come, and the Lord is coming indeed. And that produces joy within the believer. And the second coming, as we look towards the future and look towards what is awaiting us, is this great return of Christ where he returns on the clouds and comes and wipes away evil and sin of the world and restores it back to what he first made it to be in Eden. And that causes great hope to swell up in our hearts. The idea that God is returning to come and save us, to rescue us, to pull us into his presence for all eternity. And we have hope that gets us through the circumstances of this life. And so as we look at this idea of Maranatha and come Lord in the two different Advent seasons, we're going to focus today on the first Advent, the first coming of Jesus and how that has given us the church great joy. And so it's interesting when you write a, when you write a message, you think you're going to sit down and, uh, and write this really great message and nothing's going to happen. It's going to be a great week, right? And that's, that's your hope as a pastor, as a preacher, as somebody who communicates the word is that your week is going to reflect what you write about in some way, shape or form. And so we're talking about joy today. So I'm hoping that I have a really joyful week, right? It's the Christmas season, right? We're going to open some presents. We're going to hang out with family. We're going to eat some great food. I smoked some ribs yesterday. They're fantastic. Just throwing out out there. They did cause great joy indeed. But it's interesting. My week didn't start off like that. And so enter Monday. And so Monday was, was great in all of its own. We had a great staff meeting. We have time of prayer. We have, um, or, uh, we had time at home with our families this week. And so, uh, it was great to just be with, be with my family on, on a Monday morning and instead of the typical routine, it was just nice to break it up a little bit. And, and we spent all day, um, hanging out, hanging out with the kids. And that night we ended up going to SeaWorld because we heard about this incredible light show at SeaWorld, right? The most, the most Christmas lights in all of Texas, right? Is what I hear. And so we went during Halloween, unfor not, not on purpose, actually. We just, our sister-in-law came in town and she wanted to go to SeaWorld. So we're like, yeah, let's go to SeaWorld. It happened to be the Halloween celebration. And because of that, we felt like we needed to redeem 
SeaWorld, because if you've been during Halloween, um, I, as a 35-year-old, uh, I was a little scared, man. I got a little terrified, you know, there's weird stuff going on there. Um, and even during the day, right? We weren't even there at night. So we felt like we needed to go back and redeem SeaWorld. Uh, so we went during the Christmas lights, and it was great. We loved it. We had a great time. The kids enjoyed it. We had, like, those little fried donut things. We had popcorn. We watched the nativity scene. We watched, you know, the killer whales jump up in all of their glory and splendor and wonder and splash back down. And luckily, we did not get wet because it was 50 degrees. And we were worried because we are like, second row in the splash zone. Stupid, stupid thing in the winter. I don't know why we did that, but we did. Um, so thank the Lord that he protected us from the cold seawater that was in their tank. Um, but we had a great time. We laughed, you know, the kids, we loaded up the car. Everybody was all smiles and giggles and joy. And if you're a parent, you know how rare that is in the car sometimes. So we were celebrating that as well. And uh, so we, we pull in the driveway and we're all happy. We get out. We're like, okay, we're going to put the kids to bed. We're going to sit down. We're going to hang out for a little bit before Christmas. It's going to be great. Just Bree and I. And we walk in and immediately we get hit with this stench. And we're like, oh my gosh, what is that? That's, and, and our house like, like weirdly like farts every once in a while. I don't know. I don't know how else to put it, but it just randomly you get, you get a stench, right? And you're like, what is that? So I don't know where it comes from, but it's definitely the house. And so, uh, but we walk in, we smell this. And, and so our dog had, had, has been, he's a puppy. He's a golden retriever, about five months, six months old. And so, you know, he's, his body's growing and learning how to deal with food and whatnot. And my son loves to throw chocolate chips and stuff at him. That is not good for dogs. So he was experiencing some tummy issues, did his business in his kennel, right? And so we walk in and there is just dog feces all over the kennel, all over him. And so we're like, oh my gosh. So we, I open the kennel and like I lift the dog out, right? And I'm getting stuff all over me and I'm trying not to touch a wall and kind of meander through the house, right? With this 60 pound dog in my hands. And so I get him up to the bathroom and I put him in the, the tub. I grab the sprayer. I start spraying him off, clean him up, wash him. We go, all right, he's good to go. No problem. I'll go downstairs. I'll clean out the kennel. It'll be good. And we'll move on. Let's not let this steal our joy, right? Right? And so I spray him off. I get him out of the tub, dry him off. And immediately he, he goes downstairs and I'm, and I'm getting ready to go follow him. I just spray out the tub for like, literally, I'm not kidding, 10 seconds. Like <laughs> wash all the other stuff down the drain. I walk downstairs and there he is squatting to finish his business in the middle of the living room on the, kid you not, white rug. <laughs> Yes, not even brown, you can't even blend it in, right? It's going to be what it is. There it is. And so he squats, he does his business, and I'm too late. Like, it was already done. He was finishing it up. And so I'm like, no! So I pick him up, and I run outside, and I throw him outside. I'm like, crud, man, now i got to clean that up, too. And so I go, and you go get cardboard, and I scoop it into another thing of cardboard and throw it in the trash can, and then Bree cleans the carpet. And I'm in the kennel, like, with sanitizing wipes and whatnot. And we get it all cleaned up, and we're like, okay. Whew, we're good to go. We, we, we got that out of the way. All right. And then I remember her check engine light is on in the car and we needed to drop the car off Monday in order to get it fixed because I don't know if you, you've needed to get car work done anytime recently, but it's like a three month window kind of thing. Like, hey, you, we can get you, we can squeeze you in in like April, you know, can I? And so we're like, okay, well, we got to take advantage of this. So, all right, all right. Load the kids up back in the car, you know, put the dog back in his kennel, pray Jesus that he does not poop again. And so we load up, we're on our way. I'm in my truck. My wife's in her car. We're driving down the highway, and I look down, and I notice I'm out of gas. So I'm like, crud, man. Like, I'm not getting like two miles in the range kind of thing. So I'm like, okay, we got to find a gas station, pass a gas station. No problem. Get the next one. Pass that gas station. I don't know what it is, but there's not a sign before a gas station. It's like you see it afterwards. You're like, what is that about? But in my mind, I'm like, okay, I've driven this road enough in the last six months to know that there's a quick trip coming up. There goes a quick trip. All right, well, now we're at 410, needing to pull off. So I'm just like, let's just pull off. We'll find one. But it's like that part where there's like, you know, gas station, gas station, gas station, then like just this like desert of like nothingness, right? No gas station. We're driving around and like sweating bullets. I'm like, no, I got to get gas. And so I finally find a gas station, pull into the gas station, put in the, put in the pump. 
And I remember, oh, I needed to like add this stuff to my fuel because I got weird issues. So I add, so I go to add the stuff to the fuel, right? And I'm twisting on the cap and the thing falls and dumps everywhere all over the, I'm like, no. And so I grab that up, put like the little like quarter of a tank back into the tank and get that filled up. And so we're good to go, filled up the tank, hit the road, getting back on the highway. And I'm not kidding. It's probably like 930 something, 945 at this. It's late, right? Especially for little kids. And so they're losing their mind in the backseat. They're fussy, they're cranky, they're not happy with the situation. And so I'm like, okay, no problem. 410's right there. We'll get into 410. So we pull up, cop cars blocking off 410. So I need to go find another way on 410. So I drive what feels like to Austin, Texas. <laughs> and I pull off, and finally we get on 410. I'm like, okay, we got this. So we're on 410. I'm like, the last stop is the, is the dealership, right? So. We need to get off at I-10, so, you know, I get over, get off, and then I see Bree, whew, drive right past the exit. I'm like, ah, oh, no problem, right? Again, this is what we do. Whew, no problem. We can deal with this. Okay, so it's the age of Apple Maps. She's good to go. She's got the address. No problem. I'll meet her there. So I pull into the, into the, uh, the dealership, and they have, like, three entrances, and all three are blocked off and chained. So I'm like, okay. I text the guy and told him that I'd be here at like 9 or 10 that night, and I don't understand why it's locked, and he didn't tell me that it was going to be locked, so I'm like, whatever. So I drive around a little bit, do a couple loops, and then I finally find that there's a space, right, between this car, this car, curb, grass, curb, parking lot, Eden, right, the promised land, land the milk and honey, right? So, so I'm parked there, and I call Bree, I'm like, okay, I found a spot we can kind of pull in. Um, I said, but, but just stay where you're at. I'll meet you instead of trying to direct you to here. So I pull out and I pass her. She gets behind me. We make the loop. We pull back around. And as we pull into that spot of the parking lot, there's a security guard. I'm like, dude, I was gone for not even five minutes, man. And you had to show up, of course. So I pull up to the guy, roll down the window. I'm like, hey, listen, this is what's going on. So my dog pooped. We cleaned it up. He pooped again. I got kids in the car. We've missed the exit. I can't find gas. I just need to get in that parking lot. Do you have a key or can you just look the other way for like literally 10 seconds? And he goes, no, I can't do either, man. I'm sorry. And so I am angry at this point. I mean, I am very angry, very irate, like yelling, angry. I walk up to Bree. I'm like, this is a freaking thing. You know, that kind of angry. Hands flying everywhere. So the guy, after about like maybe a minute, minute and a half of hearing me, pulls up, rolls down the window and goes, hey, man. I go, yeah? He's like, you know, I need to go check the other gates. I'm going to be gone for about 15 minutes. Rolls up the window and that sweet angel of a man drives away, uh, <laughs> shining in all of his glory, right? Chariots of fire, angels, singing choirs. And I'm like, oh, thank the Lord. So Bree, out of the car, go get in the truck. I jump in the car, put it in four-wheel drive, boom, 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 in the parking lot, put the keys in the drop box. We're good to go. All right, we made it. It's the end. Get back in the truck. We're driving home. And uh, again, new here, so not entirely sure where I'm going all the time. So I do use maps pretty much every day of my life. So we, we punch in our address. We're heading back home. But I know well enough to know that I'm living on the east side. And I've driven, or I'm living on the west side. I'm, I'm driven all the way over to the east side. So we approach 410. I'm like, hey, it's 410 west, right? She goes, no, it's east. I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Why would we go further that way? So like, I'm telling you, it says 410 east. So I'm like, all right, man, follow, you know, follow the technology, right? It should be smarter than me. So we pull off 4, 410 east, and we're driving for about 15 minutes. I'm like, this doesn't feel right. There's something right here that doesn't feel right, right? So I put on, you know, the audio so I can hear the prompts, and I hear, make a U-turn. <laughs> like, what in the world? Make a U-turn. So I look at my phone, and sure enough, make a U-turn is there. We've driven for about 15 minutes. I'm like, ah. So we make a U-turn. I'm like, it's definitely West. I was right, right? You know, guys, come on. You know, I was, I was right. The technology is wrong. That's what I get for asking for directions kind of thing. <laughs> so I make a U-turn. And we pull around, and, I, and Bree and I just start laughing. I mean, it was just one of those things that boom, 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 boom. 
and you just can't do anything about it. It's just circumstantial, right? Things happen, life happens. So we get on the highway. I mean, we get home, it's like 1130, right? And the kids are just, some of them are asleep. The youngest one, the loudest one isn't asleep. And so we get home, we put the kids to bed and the night's over. But it's just interesting that as I was writing a message this week on joy, how quickly I lost my own. I just, in that moment, based on circumstances, I lost my joy. Just gone. And I think that's because sometimes our joy can be rooted in the wrong things. I think sometimes we allow our happiness, our joy to be circumstantial. And I'm telling you, man, if if it's circumstantial, there's there's gonna be some hard days ahead. There really are, because this world wants to steal your joy. The enemy wants to steal your joy. And he will do everything in his power to do that. And so as we look at our joy and how we can lose it, we forget that the reason we have it to begin with sometimes, right? We often are get so consumed by the world and what's going on in our day-to-day that we forget the reason that we even have joy to begin with. We don't seek to lose it. We don't make decisions to lose it. But the world throws things at us that steal it away. And when I read a verse like 1 Thessalonians 5.16, and it says simply this, Rejoice always. The NLT puts it this way, Always be joyful. And so I look at that verse And I ask myself, how the heck am I supposed to live that out? How am I supposed to always be joyful? Always? I mean, if it said sometimes, if it said when it's convenient, get it, can do that, no problem. But it says always be joyful. To always be joyful. Always rejoice. So how in the world are we supposed to do that, church? How are we supposed to rejoice always, to be joyful always? And I think it's because what the writer here, what Paul has, is the right perspective. He has the right perspective on life. And when we have the right perspective, then we can model a lifestyle of joy. Not a temporary, fleeting joy that is based on circumstances, but a deep, rich, unmovable kind of joy. And so when I say joy, what do I mean? Because I feel like there's a lot of definitions, right? Is it just happiness? Is it something different than happiness? Is it, you know, the radio station, Joy FM, you know, the Christian one? What is it, you know? But I think when I look at the scriptures, I definitely see that joy does mean happiness. Those are synonymous at times. It's an emotion that we can feel. And sometimes it's deeper than that, too. It's both an emotion and a feeling. And it's a work at times. But I believe that true, authentic, unwavering joy begins with the right perspective. We need to have the right perspective of God. We need the right perspective of us as his creation. And the right perspective of life and purpose. And so in the scriptures, there's a guy that definitely has the right purpose. And it's the guy that wrote 1 Thessalonians, Paul. That Paul can write a verse like this in spite of what he went through. So Paul's a man who's a murderer, killed Christians to the point where Jesus had to show up, shine a bright light on him and say, whoa, man, you're persecuting me. So this is a man who's probably living with this, right? I know we all have guilt and shame in our own lives. Paul did too. He's human. And so how can a guy who lives with that in his heart, right, rejoice always? We can see another moment where he does this too in Acts 16. So if you got your Bibles, turn there with me. Acts 16, starting in verse 16, and it says this. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met with a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. So here's a, here's a girl who can fortune tell, crystal ball, tell you the future, that kind of stuff, right? Making lots of money for the guys who owned her. So she followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And she kept doing this for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, even Paul gets annoyed with this stuff, man, all right? So I'm just saying, common person here. Paul, becoming greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. 
But when her owners saw that their hope and gain was gone, again, they're building a life on circumstances. Their hope and their gain is based on this life. They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate for customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. Imagine, church, that if we lived a life that disturbed our city kind of like this, man. So the crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off of them and gave orders to beat them with rods. So here's Paul and Silas coming along, preaching the word, cast a demon out. Great thing, right? I've never done that. I don't know if you've ever done that, but that seemed kind of like a big deal God thing, right? And now they're getting beaten for it. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet with stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke, he saw that the prison doors were open and he drew a sword about to kill himself because in that day, if the jailer lost his prisoners, they would kill him in their place. So he's thinking, done, they're gone. The doors are open. So he draws a sword and then Paul cries out with a loud voice, do not harm yourself for we are all here. So we'll finish the last half of that story in a second, but I want to pause here and download a little bit about what's going on. So here's a couple guys, right? Paul, Silas, minding their business, coming along. Girl starts annoying the heck out of them. So they cast the demon out of her and then they're beaten, thrown in prison. And their response is to sing hymns, is to pray. I mean, they could have said, God, what the heck, man? What's going on? We, we did all these cool things for you. We're, we're a good person. We're whatever, blah, 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 blah. Why are you doing this to us? Why won't you save us? Why won't you deliver? Why won't you, you know, me, me, me? Why, why, why? They can ask that question. I'm sure most of us in circumstances that are less than this have asked that question, right? But here's Paul and Silas and they begin singing. They begin praying to the point that it causes an earthquake underneath their feet and it flies open the prison doors and the shackles fall off their feet. I don't know about you, but I've never sang a song that did that. I've never prayed that a prayer that has done that. I mean, this ground's pretty steady most times. And here they are praying and worshiping with such a heart that it shakes the ground underneath their feet. So instead of asking, why is this happening to me? They say, thank you, God. Thank you. Praise you in all things. And why? Why can Paul and Silas pray and worship like this? Simply because they had the right perspective. They had the right perspective on God themselves and what their life and purpose means. So as we look at the right perspective, what is it? And the first perspective we want to look at is God. What is the right perspective to have of God? Typically, we often shape God, right, ourselves, based on our circumstances, based on what we've heard, based on how we feel, and based on what we believe. We shape God into this thing, right? And I want to tell you, your opinion doesn't matter. My opinion doesn't matter. Who I think God is doesn't matter. It's, it's not related at all. Because God is who he is. God isn't shaped by us. We are shaped by him. That God tells us who he is in his word. He says that he is holy. He says that he is just. He says that he is kind, that he is love, that he is all-knowing, all-powerful, that he is infinite in these attributes, that he is the standard and the definition of these attributes. So if I wake up today thinking, man, God is this, it doesn't matter unless he has claimed that's who he is in his word. 
And thank God he does. Thank God he has given us his word, which is a standard for all things that we believe. That his word is absolute final in all things. And thank God, because then as us, we can know who he is. We don't have to second guess it. We don't have to question, does God really even love me? Yeah, he does, because he said he did. Period, end of story. And he's a God who loves us so much that he can't even be apart from us. That he wants to dwell with us to the point that he sent his son, Jesus. I have kids and man, I can't think about giving my kids up for someone who rebels against me, who hates me, who curses my name, who doesn't want to listen to me, who thinks they know better than me. I can't give my kids up for that, but God did because that's who he is. So Paul and Silas have the right perspective of God. They know who God is. The second perspective that they have is they know who they are. They know who they are as man, as people, as creation. Our perspective on ourselves is key too because we often get puffed up, right? How many times have we said, man, I don't deserve this? How many times have I said, man, I'm a good person? Generally, I'm a good person. I mostly do the right things most of the time. So that kind of qualifies me as a good person. I mean, the good outweighs the bad, right? Yeah, sure, I've done some bad. But the good is better than the bad, so therefore, I'm a good person. Or I deserve that promotion. I deserve that house even, right? I deserve that car. I deserve that spouse. I deserve this. deserve respect. deserve whatever. It may be. We feel that we deserve things. And what we do deserve, the only thing that we deserve as people is eternal separation from God in a place called hell. Because no one is good apart from God. That nothing is good apart from God. He is a source of all goodness. So therefore, if we are apart from him, we aren't good and we can't be good. No matter how hard we try, no matter how many good things we do on the outside, right? We may think, well, you know what? I'm driving down the highway and I'm on 1604 and that guy cut me off without a blinker and I really want to give him the finger, but I'm not going to. So therefore, I'm a good person. I, I did the right thing, right? But in here, that's going on, right? You still feel that. You still think that about that person, whatever it may be. And the Pharisees did the same thing. They were great on the outside. Jesus calls them whitewashed tomb. You look good on the outside, you are dead on the inside. And likewise, apart from Christ, so were we. We can do the right things, but we can never be good apart from him. And so ask yourself this question. If all of your thoughts, emotions, feelings were shown on the five o'clock news, would that be a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> if you felt like it was, I don't feel comfortable with that. There's your answer. So Paul and Silas knew who they were. Paul was a murderer. He knew who he was apart from Christ. Yet we live as if we deserve things. We live as if we're good people. Now here's the, here's the beautiful thing. What the correct understanding of those two things, God and man does, is now it gives us the right perspective on why we are here. It gives us the right perspective on our life. It gives us the right perspective on our purpose. And it should cause us great joy. Because when we think about those two things, that here is a God who is holy. Here is a God who is infinite. Here is a God who is all powerful. And he wants to dwell with me? He wants to not be apart from me? Somebody who is wayward and a sinner? Somebody who casts him aside all the time or, or tries to push him away because we know better and I don't want to live like that. I want to live how I want to live. I want to serve myself. God died for that? It should cause us great joy, church. That we should be overwhelmed with joy for if, that God could do that for us. That God has done that for us. And that absolutely gives us great joy. When we take our eyes off Jesus and fixate them on this world, we lose our joy because we lose our perspective. We lose the perspective of what God has done for us and our joy becomes circumstantial because apart from God, it should be, right? If we don't have God in our life, we should be joyfully circumstantial. 
Because God is our purpose in our life. And if we're apart from him, then we should get whatever we want out of this world. It's short, man. We got 70, 80 years at most sometimes. So yeah, I should get the big house. I should get this. I should have the bank account with a thousand zeros into it. That becomes the means and the ends and everything of our life. And it should be apart from God because we don't have a future. We don't have a hope. We have these 70 years and boom, that's it. And that's our existence. But with God, Come on. we have more. We have hope. Our life is not based on those things anymore. Our life is based on what Jesus has done for us and how we can take that despite circumstance and share that with others so that they may have a fuller, truer picture of joy and hope in their own lives. Preach it. Preach it. Amen. And so our joy isn't circumstantial because our God is not circumstantial. That God doesn't love us more or less based on circumstances. God loves us the same. His son died for us the same. And so it's not based on circumstantial. Nothing in your life, church, is insurmountable for God. No matter what news you get, no matter the pain, the hurt, all of those things pale in comparison to the glory of God. And one day we're going to experience a world that is completely restored, made right, put back together the way God first intended it. And so we are no longer slaves, but we are free in Christ. And just, had, just as Paul had joy in all things, we now also have joy in all things because we indeed have the right perspective that the circumstances of our life are not our purpose anymore. Jesus is. That he is our purpose, he is our meaning, he is our everything. And our joy should be filled with that because that is unmovable. That is a rock that we can indeed build our life upon. And that our joy, just as Jesus is unmovable, our joy is unmovable. So when we look at this story of Paul, the reason he can fall down on his knees and praise God and worship is because his joy is built on what Christ has done for him. And nobody can take that away. So as we look at the rest of the story, Acts 16, 29, it says, and the jailer called for lights and rushed in. So remember, getting ready to kill himself, prison doors opened. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Right, I'm gonna kill myself. Like, I, I, don't, know, I don't know what to do. What, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in the house. And he took them in the same hour of night and washed their wounds. So they preached the word. And here's a guy who knows that those wounds he's partly responsible for. So he tends to them, he cleans them. And then he was baptized at once, he and all of his family. And then he brought them up to his house and set food before them and rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Because Paul and Silas had the right perspective on their circumstances, they were able to sing hymns and praise. And it literally opened a door for the gospel. They literally opened a door to share the goodness of with this man. And look, his whole family came to know Jesus and were saved and they rejoiced based on that because he has a tangible thing that, is, that he's been saved from. And then he knows now why these guys have joy in their heart. Why are they different? And when we look at our lives, church, ask yourself, how do people view me in my life based on my circumstances? Do I have joy in all things? Or am I getting mad? Am I getting upset? Am I losing my joy based on what this world throws at me? Because again, it always will. This world and the enemy will seek to steal it from you. And there is nothing he won't do to do that. And we can lose it or we can keep it based on our perspective. And so when we look at what it means to have joy, I'm not just talking about the small things. I'm not talking about I didn't flip that guy off in traffic. Sometimes it's getting something, some news that's terrible, right? It's getting the news that it's terminal and you got a few weeks to live. Sometimes it's that you got a family member who, who's sick. We just got that news. 
and what that looks like in our lives. Sometimes it means, hey, don't bother coming back in on Monday. You're gone. You're fired. Sometimes it's looking at that bill and, and feeling like, I don't know how I'm going to get above this. And if our joy isn't circumstantial, then those things can be conquered because Christ has and he now lives in us, church. And therefore, we can conquer those things and he will. That, that those bills, those, that news, the disease, whatever it may be, isn't the end of your story. It's a part of it. And God is going to use that and give that purpose for you to share his joy with others because there are other people who are going to experience those things. And now you can say, look what God did in my life. I can have joy. It can go through all of these things in my life and it can be this thread of commonality between this thing and this thing because I have Jesus and he is a source of my joy. It's not based on circumstances. It's based on him and what he has done for me. And it doesn't mean that we don't feel the pain. It doesn't mean we don't feel the hurt. It doesn't mean we don't have moments of doubt and confusion. What it means is we can even overcome those things because Christ has overcome. And if he lives in us and if we believe in him, then we indeed, church, can overcome. Amen. And I love what Jesus says in John 15. John 15 is one of my favorite passages of all time. And in this scripture, Jesus is talking to the disciples and he shares what it means to have life, right? He likens himself to a vine, and he likens us to a branch and he says that when we are attached to him that we have life and life abundantly, right? That apart from him, we wither and die. And we cease to exist. But with him, we have life and in all circumstances, we can have life. And then he goes on to say this in verse 10 and 11, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you that my joy, Jesus' joy, may be in you and that your joy may be full. See, Jesus wants our joy to be his and he wants us to have a joyful life because how could we not? He knows what he's gonna do at the cross. He knows how that's gonna restore us back to a holy God. And therefore he says, how can you not have this joy? Abide in me, follow my commandments, follow me and you will have life and you will have joy and you will have peace through all circumstances and it may be full. And joy is one of the gauges of our Christian life's dashboard. Then when we look at our life, if we, see, if we lose joy, if the needle drops, right, on our joy gauge and we lose it, that's a good indicator that says, hey, man, something's wrong. There's something not right. It's the check engine light, right, that we need to, to figure out and fix. And it simply means that we're not abiding. It simply means that we're not attached to the source of life. Because if we are, we can't, guys, we can't help but have joy. It permeates through us. It overflows from us and into everything else in our life. But it's one of the gauges that we can use to, to figure out where we're at in our relationship with Jesus. You know, when we're not close to Jesus, we're not joyful because we're not consumed by him. And sometimes that leaves the door open for us to be consumed with other things. With doubt, grief, pain, sin. We leave our door open to be consumed by sin and then therefore... Our joy is circumstantial because it's based on those things, how much we can get of this. And sometimes it's not the big thing. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's lying. Sometimes it's pornography. Sometimes, you know, it's anger or alcohol abuse. Sometimes it's those things. Sometimes it's a little more under the radar. Complacency, laziness, being stagnant, right? And there's these really incredible two quotes that I want to share with you this morning based on this. And the first one is by Jonathan Edwards. He's an incredible preacher in the 1700s, and he says this, The enjoyment of God is the only happiness with which our souls can be satisfied to go to heaven. Fully to enjoy God is infinitely better than the most pleasant accommodations here. Hear that. Being with God is better than anything here, as good as it may look. Fathers, mothers, husbands, wives, children, and the company of earthly friends are but shadows. But God is the substance. These are but scattered beams, but God is the sun. These are but streams, but God is the ocean. That God is the source of joy. That our joy isn't based on circumstance. It's based on the source of that joy, which is God. Yes. And that if we let that permeate through everything in our lives, then we can indeed be filled with joy as well. 
Jim Johnson says, when we get up from the table after Thanksgiving, the last thing I want is more food. Amen, right? Hopefully we're full to that point. You can't tempt me with another bite. In the same way, it's hard for Satan to tempt a joyful believer with empty pleasures of this world because you are full, overflowing with joy from God. And he can't even tempt you because there's no room. So when Jesus consumes our lives, our thoughts, and our purpose, then we can't help but be filled with joy to the point that nothing else in this world remotely comes close. It doesn't look appetizing that we're a new creation in Christ, that the old is gone and that we are a new creation. So therefore, we desire new things, which is Jesus, not the old. And so as we look at this, you know, Some of us are struggling to abide. Some of us are sitting here right now saying, man, it's been a long time. I've done this, I've done that. I haven't been close to God. And I'm just gonna say, start. Just start somewhere. Read your Bible for five minutes. Pray a simple prayer of thanksgiving to him. Start somewhere. God will see that and honor that and build upon that in your life. So it's not too late to come back to him and to have joy, true joy. And so as we close, I wanna ask you this question. When you look at your life, when how people look at your life, is your life divine, divine by joy or by circumstance? Is your life defined by true, authentic joy in Jesus? Or is your life defined by circumstances. So man, if everything works out my way today, then I'm going to be happy. Then I'm going to have joy. Then I'm going to have peace. Then I'm going to have life. Then I can treat others with kindness. Or is it that I deserve nothing and my God has loved me enough to give me himself, everything that he is, and trade it for everything that I am, that I deserve hell. I deserve to be separated from God, but God you weren't satisfied with leaving me there. And God, how can I not be filled with joy about that? That I was dead and now I'm alive. And I can't help but be joyful over that. That even if I'm thrown in prison and beaten, I'm gonna sing songs that shake the ground underneath my feet because I have you and nothing else matters in my life. So church... Is your joy opening doors? Is your joy defining you as a Christian that makes you different than the rest of the world? Is it opening doors for people to look at you and say, man, I I heard what the hospital said, but how are you still smiling? How do you still have joy in your life? I don't understand. I'd be crushed right now. Because Jesus, because this isn't the end of my story. It's a part of it. And if I follow Jesus, then even this part, he's going to use for good. And it gives those moments purpose and meaning. So it's time to be known, church, by joy. It's time to live a life that others look at and ask why you're so joyful. Because there's jailers all around us looking at us. There's others in the jail cells with us looking at us. And if we can sing songs and rejoice in all things and have the right perspective then so we can teach others to do the same. And so that night after we got home and put the kids to bed, I laid down and I was kind of reflecting on that in this message and and God kind of spoke to me in that moment and I want to read you what, what what he said. And I want to leave you with this. It says this, joy can be a feeling and joy can be a choice. It can be both of those things, church. But the deeper root is that it starts with the right perspective. True joy has the proper perspective of who God is and who you are and what he has done for you. I don't deserve anything. I don't deserve to have a home, have a family, have a job, hit all the green lights on my way to work. I don't deserve even my salvation. But God, in his infinite love for me, and you has given to us out of an abundance of himself that whatever we have in this life is better than even what we deserve. And when all else is lost, church, we have the greatest gift the world has ever known. We have Jesus and we can rejoice in all circumstances because of that, because nothing can take him away from you 
and nothing can rip you away from him. That when he died on the cross, it was permanent. It was final. It was absolute. Nothing can change that. And so if you're sitting there and you've been a Christian for a while and you're asking, how do I have joy, Kurt? How do I do that? Start by attaching yourself to the one who's the giver of joy, the giver of life. Come back to Jesus. Start opening your word. Get serious about him because church, he was serious about you enough to die for you. That's how serious Jesus is about you. And likewise, we need to be that serious about him, giving our lives and everything that we are to him and his purpose. And if you're hearing this for the first time, or maybe you've heard it for a couple times and it's never hit home, there is no time like now to have joy. You don't need to wait until next week or tomorrow. You can have this right now. That like God says anybody who calls upon his name will be saved. And we believe that. So I'm gonna pray. And if, and if you are hearing this for the first time and you wanna follow Jesus and have this kind of joy, I'm gonna ask that you pray with me. Father, we thank you. Thank you for joy. Thank you for the right perspective. God, thank you for you being the unmovable rock. God, thank you for being who you are despite what we wanna think you are. God, thank you for your son, Jesus, and what he's done on the cross, that that was final, that was absolute. And God, I accept that. God, I want that. I want a new life. I want you. I want your joy. So God, I give everything I am in full surrender to you. God, shape me and mold me. Lead me. God, be the Lord of my life in all things. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Now, if you prayed that for the first time, we're not gonna do anything weird, not gonna ask you to come up on stage and give a speech, anything like that. But what I'm gonna ask you to do is simply put your hand up because we wanna celebrate with you because we're in a church that believes in celebrating dead things, returning back to life. And so if you prayed that for the first time, I'd just love for you to put your hand up. Put your hand up high. Here's a high. God, we thank you, Jesus, for you. God, May we find joy in our cry of Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, that you have come and you are coming again. And God, that gives us joy because now we have salvation. God, that you have taken our imperfection and given us your perfection. God, that you paid the price for our sin and we have joy over that, a joy that no one can rip away, no thing can rip away, no news can rip away. And God, may we sing, may we pray, to lead others to know that joy as well. God, we love you and we thank you, Jesus. And it is in your name, amen.